They say they've found that when you stimulate part of the brain, I've forgotten which particular part it is, you can create a very strong sense of oneness. Your sense of boundary between yourself and the world outside dissolves. There's about a very satisfying sense that you're at one with everything that you're aware of. Of course, this doesn't mean you really are at one. It's just that the brain is sending that signal. And the question, what use is that perception? If you're feeling at one with things, can you change them? Can you be better? Can you exert control over them? And even though there may be a sense of well-being that comes with that oneness, how lasting is it? The Buddha himself pointed out that the highest sense of oneness is this sense of consciousness being totally one and single. Everything in the range of your consciousness becomes one. But he said, even in that sense of oneness, there's inconstancy, there's stress. It's not totally under your control. Another point, he pointed out the idea that you are one with the world, or you're one with the cosmos, as being the most ridiculous self-view there was. Because after all, if you are one with something, if it really is you, you should be able to control it. Get it to do what you want. All you have to do is think, and there, there it goes. It changes in line with your thought. And if something is you, then it's also going to be yours. And if you're at one with everything, then the piece of land next to ours is yours. Everything that comes along should be yours, but it's not. Try to go exert your, your ownership over things, and a lot of things people will fight you off. So the sense of oneness may be a nice state of concentration, it may be a very relaxing sense of well-being. But beyond that, it doesn't really mean anything, it doesn't have any truth value. And it's certainly not the end of suffering. A more useful way of looking at your sense of self is looking at where you do exert control. And John Suat once noticed that even though we have the teachings that the five aggregates are not self, we have that chant we chanted just now. Anapisaro, there's no one in charge. Asako loko. This world has nothing of its own, which means there's nothing of your own there either. That sense nothing is worthy of calling you or yours. But we also have that chant, Kamasagomhi, I'm the owner of my actions. He said, think about that. There's a very useful teaching in that paradox. We do have the power to exert control over our intentions right now. And our intentions do shape our experience of the world around us and the world inside us, at least to some extent. Because what we're experiencing right now is the result of past intentions, plus our current intentions, plus the result of current intentions. Even though we may not have absolute control over things, and we'll ultimately have to let them all go, we do have some control over them now, and you want to make the most of that. You want to be able to fabricate a path to the end of suffering out of these things, Why you have the ability to do it, because there comes a point where you have to let all this stuff go and then just go on to who knows where. Is that what we're doing as we're meditating is to find out exactly how much control can you exert 
over form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness. In terms of generosity, you may have things that are yours. In fact, one of your first experiences of freedom is when you have something that's yours, but you decide you want to give it away. That's your first sense that you're not totally a slave to your desires, totally a slave to your greed. You learn how to say no to them. Then you find that there's a higher pleasure that comes as a result. It's a very skillful sense of control. The same with the precepts. You can say no to your desire to harm someone else, no to your desire to harm yourself in ways that seem pleasant in the short term but are harmful in the long term. And so that's a useful sense of control, a skillful sense of control, when you're practicing concentration. You're taking those five aggregates and you're basically you're pushing against what are called the three characteristics. Ani Chang, okay, see how constant you can make your mind. Du Kang, okay? see how, what a sense of pleasure you can create out of your sense of the body, out of your present awareness. Anatta, how much can you control the mind? Push against the envelope. Then you find that you can create a sense of greater constancy than you've had any other, any other way. Greater pleasure than you've experienced in, from any other thing. Greater control over your mind. This is both a pleasant dwelling and a basis for more mindfulness and a basis for more discernment. It's easier to be mindful when your sense of the breath and the body feels really good. It's easier to stay with it for long periods of time. So you want to take advantage of that. It's easier to see things clearly when everything is very still. It's like the water in a lake. If the water is still, you can see clearly what's at the bottom of the lake. If it's stirred up by wind, there's too much movement on the top. If there's a strong current in the lake itself, it gets muddied. And even though there may be the same stones and everything else that's under the water, when it's clear, you can't see them through the water. If it allow everything to settle down, things become a lot clearer. You can see the movements of the mind, where its movements cause stress, where they don't cause stress, or at least where they reduce the amount of stress you've been experiencing. So in this practice, we're pushing against those characteristics of inconstancy, stress, and not-self for a very good purpose. It allows us to gain the wisdom that goes beyond them, ultimately. This is what I was saying last night, that you do develop a healthy sense of self as you pursue the practice. You do get a greater sense of control. You have to make sure it's healthy. The Buddha says, don't go comparing yourself, saying, well, my practice is better than other people's practice, or I'm a better person because my practice is better than theirs. That's not helpful at all. What's helpful is that you begin to gain a healthier sense of well-being, greater insight into what's going on in the mind by pushing in this direction. Ultimately, you find that things push back. The mind can be made only so constant through concentration. So after all, this element of intention that keeps it going is something that you have to keep Keep fabricating again and again and again. And even though it's 
relatively easeful, there's still an element of stress simply in that fact. That's when you run up against how far you can control, control these things. And this is one way you can induce you can induce a sense of dispassion, disenchantment. That no matter how good it gets, and this is as good as it gets in terms of creating a fabricated sense of well-being, it's still not totally sure. It's still not totally solid totally constant. Now some people might give up at this point saying, well, this is as good as it gets. I'm going to have to satisfy myself here. But the Buddha was not that kind of person. He tried to see if there was some way that you could touch the unconditioned. He found that there was. By developing these things as far as they can go and then letting them go. The old image of climbing up to the top of a pole and then letting go. Then you find that you don't fall, because you've let go of gravity. You've let go of time and space. And that's something you can't control, but it doesn't matter at that point. Because it doesn't need to be controlled. It doesn't need to be fashioned. You don't have to keep working at it. It has nothing to do with parts of the brain being stimulated or not being stimulated. It lies, lies outside of that dimension. And although you might say there's a oneness there, it's a different kind of oneness. It's not based on a perception. It's based on total unlimitedness. So as we work on the practice here, it's important that you be very clear about what your sense of control is. That's where your self is going to be found. To the extent that you're creating a self. And that's the sense of self that actually is useful. It's not sentimental. It's not based on some abstract idea. It's based on your skill level. And you want to expand your skills. So it can lead you to greater, greater happiness and falling to the point where you don't need those skills anymore. And the whole issue of control gets set aside. The whole issue of self and not self gets set aside. But you get there by exploring exactly how much control you do have over these aggregates, how much control you do have over your actions, and pushing them in as skillful a direction as you can.